Associate Director for Public and Community Programs here at the museum. And I'd like to welcome you all to the third and final um, program in the Flower Power Poetry Series. Um, incredibly honored to welcome today's poets, Tony Robles, Bonnie Kwong, and Rodessa Jones. These three artists and activists create work that is thoughtful, fiery, and critical of the status quo, which is exactly what we need in these contentious times. I'd like to thank Ma Shane Nguyen and Coral Reef for introducing me to the world of local poets and helping shape this series with their ideas and suggestions. Throughout time, words have been woven into poetry to spark imagination, inspire movements, and propel people into worlds of rhythm and rhyme. During the Summer of Love, flowers became powerful symbols of peace, a concept plucked from Buddhist art. More than merely decorative, floral imagery has helped convey ideas from the refined to the revolutionary for thousands of years. In the words of Heathcote Williams, if poetry isn't revolutionary, it's nothing. Poetry is heightened language, and language exists to affect change, not to be a tranquilizer. We are lucky today also to have um, Ma Shane Nguyen as today's MC. Ma is a Burmese-American poet, editor, and educator who lives and works in the Bay Area. Her writing has appeared in many journals and several anthologies, including Cimarron Review, Fanzine, 1111, The Fabulist, and Crossroads, Poetry Between LA and San Francisco. She was artist in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts and is a member of the San Francisco Writers Grotto. She often collaborates with visual artists, musicians, and other writers. Her poetry chapbook with paintings by artist Mark Dutcher, Ruins of the Glittering Palace, was published by SPA Commonwealth Projects. Her most recent poetry chapbook, Score and Bone, was nominated for a CLMP Firecracker Award. She is the first poet laureate of El Cerrito. Thank you all for coming, and please help me welcome Mom. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to feature Rodessa Jones, Bonnie Kwong, and Tony Robles um, for the final reading for the Flower Power series. And um, I'd like to thank Allison and everyone here at the Asian Art Museum um, for all their amazing work. This has just been a wonderful show, and it's going to be ending October 1st. Ooh, so tell all your friends to come. Um, and if you're free this Sunday, uh, Megan Wilson, uh, one of the artists in the show, is going to do a flower introduction, I'm sorry, interruption, in front of the museum at 11 a.m. Um, so please tell your friends and join us. And I would also like to extend my gratitude to Megan and Christopher, her partner, for their commitment and dedication um, to the Liz Project. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Tony. Tony Robles is a poet and activist born and raised in San Francisco. His poetry has appeared in many journals and magazines, including Kanoi Poetics and the Asian Pacific American Journal. He is the author of Pool Don't Live Here No More, A Letter to San Francisco, and the upcoming Fingerprints of a Hunger Strike to be released in October 2017 by Ethereal Spear Press. Tony is a nominee and finalist for Poet Laureate of San Francisco and the current recipient of an individual artist grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission. Um, let's please welcome Tony. Pots 
and pan smeared in onions and garlic and chili and tomatoes and beans and tofu and okra and all the stuff you never forgot sitting on our tongues and leaping in the aroma of our imaginations. And in the simmer of love, we found the right temperature, room temperature, skin temperature, love temperature, knowing how to adjust to the fevers and chills and dips and highs and lows of the landscape as our bodies became one. And in the simmer of love, those of us yet born fermented in the waters and oils and tonics of our mother's bellies, carrying the stuff that those who came before us stuffed in sacks before taking a chance in a place whose language wasn't theirs, whose welcome mats were turned upside down and inside out. And in the simmer of love, our mothers and fathers sweated and went to night school and cleaned toilets and prayed to God for a government job and whipped our asses and wept regardless of whether we deserved it. And in the summer of love, we found each other like two moths fluttering in the dark. In the simmer of love, there was a little bit extra, a little excess, and we'd send a plate down the hall to Elaine or Lola or Iris, who always said, thank you, baby. And in the summer of love, we'd throw it all in a pot and let it sit, not knowing how it'd come out. Sometimes it came out good, sometimes it came out bad. But we didn't think of the outcome as we were coming, coming, coming to that idea, that place, that area of consciousness with our eyes both open and closed and the rent was cheap. In the simmer of love, our initials were carved in Golden Gate bark. And the dogs still howl in the morning. And the simmer is a boil. And in the broth, and the broth is thin, and our houses are dark, and our pots are cold, like Carlos Santana sang about. The simmer is now a boil, a blister, a festering sore in a cold wind. The entrails of a kite dragging, pockets pick, locks change. Long live the simmer. Love. City's always changing. City always changes, like somebody changing his mind, somebody changing his heart, somebody changing his skin, somebody changing his shoes. taking us through a whole lot of change. The city changes its face, its color, its prints of finger, heart, and tongue. The, the, the city changes its mind like a mind changes its shoes. The city changes its flavor and its swallow. The city changes its heart like a pair of socks. The city changes and rearranges in the bargain basement bazaar where Memories are sold on a plate of blue. The city changes, but the hills remain, conforming to the curvature of amplitudes and attitudes in a constant orbit around itself. The city changes like a lover who slept with you and forgot you. And the city changes like a bus transfer, a dollar bill, a roll of toilet paper. And the city changes, like a war, I know you know this trip, changes like a sheet in the aftermath of love em and leave them love me. And the city changes like leaves that never leave, yet leave nothing but memories and no longer remembers. The city changes like a box of tissue collecting our tears. <laughs> Somebody said that they were not going to come here because they weren't into poetry about flowers. I don't like to write about flowers.
Because there's something in here that says by A.A. A. Milne, Milne or Milne, it says what, weeds are flowers too. Weeds are flowers too once you get to know them. My uncle, the late poet Al Robles of Manila Town, also wrote that. So who is to say that the weeds are not the roots? And who is to say that the roots are not the weeds? So if you can't figure that out, I suggest you put on your trousers and go to a yard and start picking those weeds and get to know them. Um, so the city is a flower. We have tens of millions of flowers across this country right now known as the Dakla flower, D-A-C-A, -A, the Dakla flower. And this is a flower that dreams, dreams fragrance, and dreams color, and dreams stability and movement. This is Dakla. Dreamers cross oceans and seas and fertile, and make fertile the deserts that stretch across the borders of the mind. Dreams seen in eyes blotted by tears, startled by stars stirring in, stirring in the night sky. Dreamers turn sand into flowers. Dreamers take dreams caught in the tangled barbed wire throat and cough up new dreams over and over. New songs over and over. Dreamers paint murals with their eyes. Dreamers navigate the current and carry the past on their shoulders, backs, skin. Dreamers dream in many colors, creating more colors. Beyond the cue, beyond the eyes concept. Dreamers document the unsaid, the unseen, making it visible. Dreamers dream away silence. Dreamers fill the cracked spaces in the landscape of our minds. Dreamers. Okay. I got two other poems and I got to read because I got, I, I work down the street. You know, if, I, if I don't show up, they're going to can my ass. What time is it? <laughs> I say, Robles, you might be okay with the poetry. Poetry, but when it comes to clocking in on time, you ain't shit. Uh, <laughs> so, that's right. But yeah, yeah, right. Sweet dream, baby. Okay, so uh, we got, uh, you know, the thing about the, the flowers of Frisco, San Francisco, of Frisco is like, you know, sometimes you can't tell the fake flower from the real flower. Right? You're trying to smell these flowers, you can't tell. A fake flower from the real flower. So I'm here to impart upon you the real flower. This is called bacon. And a lot of people don't like the word Frisco, but that's why I say it. But this is called Fakin Frisco. 10,000 Fakin Frisco fools, Fakin organisms, Fakin orgasms, spasms in the fault lines carved thoughtless blamed on the faultless, running up and down the spine, Frisco faked and half-baked, the funk of Frisco, faked like a fragrance hatched in a lab that even a skunk could sniff out underwater, faking Frisco like a fake fur, a fake watch, a fake face, tick-tock, fake tick, fake top. We know what time it is. Frisco flakes for breakfast, fake blues, fake greens, and the fake of Frisco, let me tell you, the bullets are real, the sirens are real, as are the halos, the color handcuffs. That's what's real in this fake Frisco. And uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, you know, I'm going to read one other poem. It's about you know, being from San Francisco, being born and raised here, being a fifth generation San Francisco. This is my home. I don't want to go anywhere. Okay? I don't want you to evict my ass. I don't want to go anywhere. This is my home. I ain't going nowhere. Even if it's just to spite you, okay? I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here, okay? I'm, I'm, I was born here in Frisco, and I'm staying here in Frisco. And you're going to have to drag my fucking ass out of here. Drag me to nowhere, okay? So this is called, and I said,
say that respectfully, I know that I'm in a place of respectability. And this is called, There's No Other Place. There's no other place that changes colors, changes faces, changes places, changes plume, changes fume, like this place. Moving at a flaccid, classic pace with chameleon intentions, with everywhere and nowhere to go. No other place where trickle down, tie-dye tears tell lies while rainbows are painted the color of blood. There's no other place that can assume you and consume you in a cup with a $15 price tag. No other place that tattoos its buildings on our skin in the ink of thick fog then burns it off over and over again. No other place where eye sockets are mined and flags are planted, are planted the length of the spine. No other place where bridges cross you and dare you to jump into the deep end of the postcard. No other place where your face is on a wanted poster one day and on an unwanted poster the next. No other place that makes love to you and makes life to you and sucks you through a straw and leaves you with a thin blanket. No other place that suspends you and upends you and unearths you at the drop of an eyelash. There's no other place for me to be. Sister, there's no other place for me to be. No, there's no other place for me to be. Activist, poet, there's no other place for me to be. Tenant, renter, there's no other place for me to be. Teacher, dreamer, fighter, eviction, resistor, activist, there's no other place for me to be. No other place for me to be but this place that gave birth to me and my family and my poetry and my anger and my fire and my love. No other place for me to be. No other place that kisses me goodbye over and over again. No other place that plants his kiss on me and says goodbye over and over again. No other place that kisses me goodbye over and over again. No other place. in my ear. 
You let me borrow English books about skies blue as forget-me-nots, not found in Hong Kong, where the sky itself is scarce. My only reference is the opaque color of your eyes, the lavender print on your dress. In your library, poetry was weeping for fair daffodils I never knew. The same flowers my mother called Narcissus. So you see, water nymphs rising from swollen balls each lunar new year. I never wept for so you see, though I relished the waking, the final release of sweetness in open air. So you see, I thought all daffodils had petals the color of crayon sun. It took 12 years, another country, El Salvador. I found out four Marinal missionaries were raped and murdered by soldiers while I learned to weep for fair daffodils that haste away so soon. Not knowing their names were Ita, Mora, Dorothy, and Jean. Sister, the beauty. 
She spent her youth studying mirrors, mercurial things of time. Quicksilver had come by sea from California, where Chinese miners inhaled fumes of insanity. I drank the fragrance of tea in the holes of armed clippers, long sparred, low to water, lofty canvases to clip the speed from the last inch of wind. Swift privateers, bearers of slaves, and other perishable cargo. The Baltimore Clipper type of sailing craft is a delicate creation not unlike a fine violin or a thoroughbred racehorse with the ultimate purpose for its existence being only one thing performance. The first tea of the year to arrive in London yielded the highest. The clipper Nightingale cut her first waves in New Hampshire with her sharp bow and sleek hull. Her figurehead, the soaring soprano Jenny Lind. She raced tea from Shanghai to London in a record 91 days. For her next owner, she sailed to the coast of Africa, a sloop of war, found her at Cabenda with men, women, and children chained between decks and more waiting on the beach. Fever took many en route to Liberia. The ocean of oblivion hid their stench and ferried her captain Bowen, prince of slavers, port to port on his secret trade in small winds and pleasant weather. A shipwright built his wooden craft on cradle and crib work carved the keel, her spine, the frame, her ribs, from fine-grained oak. Beams, deck, and ceiling planks from dense, resonant pine. Spars from Skip, Sitka spruce and Douglas fir. Trunnels from locust curved braces from the sweeping limbs of live oak, knees from the roots of larch. The vessel raked. The shipwright knocked out trigger timbers to ease her into birth waters. What did he know of the arms on board to guard her course and cargo? Swivel guns close range, wide art, to point back at rebellion on deck. Iron carriage guns in one piece, thick breached for propulsion. Blunder buses, thunder guns of loud report, large bore, wide mouthed, as the captive jaws pried open with speculum oris force feeding to quell the quiet insurrection of hunger on deck. Wide mouths as songs of lamentation to the strings of banjar after dance coerced at point of whiplash. Dance of raw flesh against iron shackles in ankle to ankle proximity. Wide mouthed as the pretty woman losing her teeth to Captain Filippio's fist as he forced her before he clamped the mouth of a 10-year-old and pried her open beneath him. Sold, price reduced in Saint-Domingue, 
The woman died in two weeks. I drank beads of sweat on cane field slaves, tears of the skin. I drank gold paint on the spiral stairs of Bristol mansions. I drink molasses distilled to pure escape in the shackles of addiction. I drink cocoa and coffee, brown ivory on the backs of sold children. I drink the cold winds of hunger. I drink the mirage of blue glass beads in a growing desert. I drink raindrops of knowledge, reviving desert fish dormant in mud. I drink the clean air of restraint. I drink my fill from a clear glass. I drink truth loosened from ice to vapor. I drink the cooling of war and desire. I drink to my children, not far from the wrecked ship. In tides, tide pools, stars spangled with possibilities. I drink the metallic memory of tea. I drink his torpid history. Mm. So this last poem, um, I decided to read in part because, you know, history is always uh, looming in the present. And this is an excerpt from a much, much longer poem, The Quenching. In the grace of these red woods, bowing in the wind, there is thirst like a dry creek bed. There is a thirst for each animal. There is a thirst for each plant. There is the shared thirst of a dry creek bed. A thirsty woman sits by the dry creek bed. She asks the sky to send the rain her father felt as a boy on the house boat in a deep sound. The rain on the hard shells of oysters on their soft beds of silt. Oysters with flesh like supple tongues. Oysters with minute pearls on flesh like supple tongues. The rain on the roof of the houseboat. The rain on the shoji windows his father built. The rain on the deck. The rain in the bucket on the deck. The rain on the pulley. The rain on the rope. The rain on the water of the deep sound. The rain on the small boat he rowed from their houseboat to school. The rain on the spoon his mother climbed on the pot to guide him home from the fog. A thirsty woman sits by the dry creek bed. She softens like the sesso flesh of an oyster. She hardens like the shell's osseous resistance. She thinks like a growing pearl. There was a time before her father was born. Pearl meant a concretion of nature found in oysters. And why Moni? 
Pearl Waters was a lagoon off the coast of Oahu. Hawaiians fished there. Though oysters were plenty, they placed no value on pearls. By the time the woman's father was born, pearl meant a concretion of nature found in oysters. Harbor meant an inlet deep enough to shelter a boat. Pearl Harbor had been dredged to shelter warships. By the time he was 13, her father was living on a houseboat, shucking oysters with a dull knife. He held them with care, as if he loved them. He had learned early how the shells of kaki could cut into his palm like crenellated blades. He was after small slabs of flesh, small slabs of flesh, small slabs of flesh and the sudden gift of a pearl. Do oysters feel pain? he asked. His Buddhist mother and sister were too ashamed to answer. Small slabs of flesh, ahimsa. Small slabs of flesh, ahimsa. Small slabs of flesh, ahimsa. As the boat rocked, dhamma i dhamma, dhamma i dhamma, dhamma his mother and sister would rather count prayer beads than pearls. Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu. December 7, 1941. Pearl still meant a concretion of nature found in oysters. Dama, Idama, Dama, Idama, Dama, Idama. Harbor still meant an inlet deep enough to shelter a boat. Dama, a dama, dama, a dama, dama, a dama. Pearl Harbor. The family had to leave their houseboat in the sound. As they looked out from the back of the army truck, they saw their dog chasing after them. Panting, 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 panting. Growing smaller, 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 smaller. Tule is a large, hard stem bulrush. Common tule. Hard stem tule. Tule brush. Hard stem bulrush. Viscid bulrush. Tule lake. It was a camp for no no boys. Dama, a dama, dama, a dama, dama, a dama. If there was one in the family, the entire family went to stay together. Dama, a dama, dama, a dama, dama, a dama. A pearl is an oyster's way of protecting itself from foreign substances. The younger brother of a no-no boy might ask two questions. Could an oyster sometimes mistake part of its own body for a foreign substance? Is there anyone not too ashamed to answer this question? Yes, no. No, yes. Yes, yes. No, no. A thirsty woman sits by the dry creek bed. She softens like the sessile flesh of an oyster. She hardens like the shell's osseous resistance. She sinks like a growing pearl. Thank you. San Francisco Performance Company, Clitchman Odyssey. She is an actress, teacher, director, and writer.
Grace Jones is also the, direct, uh, the director of the award-winning Medea Project, Theater for Incarcerated Women in HIV Circle, which is a performance workshop designed to achieve personal and social transformation with incarcerated women and women living with HIV. Modessa has just been invited by the prestigious Dartmouth College to be a Montgomery Fellow, conducting lectures and workshops in early fall 2017. Um, let's please welcome Rodessa. Thank you. I'm looking, I was looking at Ruby's poem. I smile like a flower, not only with my lips. 
but with my whole being, and you would want to know me. Okay, you would want to know this persona. Next story is my, uh, I teach art to incarcerated people all over the globe. And about 15 years ago, I was in Alaska at a children's prison, and I met a little black boy, nine years old. His name was Paris Jackson. He was from Paris, Texas. His grandfather had been, his grandfather's name was Colonel uh, Pe uh, Packer Pepper, and his horse's name was Babe. And I'm in, I'm in a group with all of these children. I mean, a cornucopia of life, white children, black children, brown children, blue children, red children, in Alaska, in the middle of winter. And this little black boy says, I, I, I'm, I'm telling them that we're going to write poems. And he says, I, I don't know nothing about poems. I don't know nothing about poems. And the kids start saying, OK, tell us your name. And it was Paris Jackson. Where are you from? Paris, Texas. And he went on, and all of the children literally said, our children, I love you children. They said, you are a poem, Paris. You are the poem. And Paris Jackson was nine years old, and he was in jail because he'd already taken out an adult for a, a group of, of gang members. And they were keeping him in protection, of, in protective custody. And, but he was a child, he was a baby. And I thought, poems, what are poems? We're all poems. I'm a migrant child. My mother and father were migrant workers. And I grew up hearing about California. I grew up hearing that this was the promised land. From these two people, my father was from Columbus, Georgia, my mother was from Valdosta, Georgia, and between them they didn't have 12 years of education, but they dreamed of this state. And so I grew up hearing about it, and I traveled up and down the seaboard with my parents, picking vegetables, um, picking fruits, going to school, being told that in a lot of ways that I wasn't allowed there, and having to make sense of it all. And I'll tell y'all, <laughs> Dartmouth ain't no day at the beach either. Have you read anything about what's going on at Harvard? Is it Harvard? Is it Harvard? With uh, Michelle Jones, the uh, young black woman who has uh, been, uh, she's been like denounced. Uh, uh, Mich uh, Michelle Jones as Chelsea Manning. And uh, these people have been like sort of put aside because they don't fit the profile. So, you know, schools like Dartmouth. And I wanted to bring my Medea project to Dartmouth. My Medea project, which is a group of ex-offenders, uh, women live with HIV, as you described, and the director of the foundation freaked out. He said, oh, no, 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 no. This place was not made for them. Mm. Mm. We don't want those kind of people wandering around here. And I'm like, what kind of people are you talking about, sir? And I had to concede and say, well, no, okay, I won't bring my folks to Dartmouth, but you're gonna be sorry because they're fabulous and they're delicious. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then love. I fell in love again at the age of 50 with a fabulous Mexican man, Humberto Santiago. And um, I was leaving Walgreens and he came up to my car and he said, excuse me, but you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. You know, we're racist. I'm looking like this is a snatch my purse. Who are you talking to? And he says, no, I'm talking to you. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And I just need to say that. And, and uh, no disrespect that continued. I said, hey, come here. <laughs> See, the most beautiful woman you've ever seen is going to give you her phone number. <laughs> And you're going to call me, okay? And he said, oh. I said, yeah, oh, baby, please. Call me those eyes. I need the eyes. And we made love, kissed, laughed for 11 years, and then he died. He was not documented in America. And it broke his heart. He was the finest human being I ever encountered. And it broke his heart that he had to live his life looking over his shoulders. And he developed tumors in his shoulders. And he died. And I thought I would die, but I remember he taught me. I'd already I'd known about Pablo Neruda, but it was lying in bed with Humberto and talking about 
poetry, you're talking about religion. And Umberto told me the story of Pablo Neruda and how Pablo Neruda would go into a town. And he was such, he was so the people's poet that he began with this one poet, uh, tonight I could write the saddest lines. And I, I did not know that the whole town would know the poem. He says the whole room would recite the poem with this poet. Mm -hmm. And thus I met, I went into poetry from, a, from Latin America, Central, Central America, South America, with this man who I adore. And I'd like to begin tonight with my first poem, which was given to me, uh, suggested to me by my very good friend, Valerie, who is here. She is one of my favorite people. And this is Ode to Some Yellow Flowers by Pablo Neruda. Against the blue moving its own blue, the sea and against the sky, some yellow flowers. October arrives. And though it may be so important for the sea to enroll its myth, its mission, its peace like its inspiration, there explodes over the sand the gold of a single yellow plant. And your eyes are fixed on the ground. They flee from the great sea and its ripples. We are and will be dust. Not air, not fire, not water but dust, earth, only earth will we be, and maybe also some yellow flowers. Thank you. Students. 
and 20 of the guys died in Vietnam. I graduated high school in 1966. So I, I think I owe it to them to sort of at least watch some rendition, some replica, something about this amazing time in our lives, you know. And, uh, and so as I was thinking about coming to, to read poetry, I was saying, you know, well, what about Vietnam? The book about Vietnam, and what does it have to do with all of us? But this is America, goddammit. Agent Orange, with his madness, has to either be ignored or cut down. We're not going there anymore. We are, the, we are golden. We're sawdust. And we can't forget that. We can't forget that as we move through the rest of our lives. So as, uh, this is uh, Mary Oliver. I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin two or three years ago. And everybody got so snobby about Mary, Mary Oliver. They were like, oh, you know, she's a poet that makes a living. So what? <laughs> <laughs> so did that not make her valid? Oh, well, you know, she's not, I guess she's not serious because she makes a living. Oh, damn it, I don't want to make a living as a poet. I think, po I think poetry is what feeds us, moves us, drives us. Mary Oliver asked, what if a hundred rose rested rose beads flew in circles around your head? What if the marking bird came into your house with you and became your advisor? What if the bees filled your walls with honey and all you needed to do was ask them and they would fill the wall? What if the brook slid downhill just past your bedroom window so you could listen to its slow prayers as you fell asleep? What if you painted a picture of a tree and the leaves began to rustle and a bird sang cheerfully from the painted branches? What if you suddenly saw the silver of water was brighter than the silver of money? What if you finally saw that the sunflowers turning towards the sun all day and every day, who knows how, but they do it, were more precious, more meaningful than gold? How would you live then? Nobody told her. Nobody told her. 
that her baby's brains would be splattered on the back seat of a car in the tenderloin. Nobody talked of her. So how was she supposed to know? Nobody told her. Nobody. Mr. Medea Patrick Sheep, thank you.
the break of day, I think it's called, but um, it begins like this. Sir, you ask me, her mother writes, sir, you ask me to come and spend a week with you, which means I would be near my daughter, whom I adore. You who live with her know how rarely I see her, how much her presence delights me, and I'm touched that you would ask me to come and see her. At the same time, I'm not going to accept your invitation for the time being at any rate. The reason is that my pink cactus is probably going to flower. <laughs> it is a very rare plant, a very rare plant I've been given, and I'm told that in our climate it flowers only every four years. Now, I am already a very old woman, and if I went away when my pink cactus is about to flower, I'm certain I should see it again flower in this life. So I beg you, sir, to accept my sincere thanks and my regrets, and together with kind regards of C. Dog, that was her mother. And my granddaughter is living with me right now, Chastity Paul Robinson. I'm going away, she's going to maintain now. She's 27, but she's still my only baby. And uh, she says, Grandma, the only thing that bothers me is I don't want to blow up with your flowers. <laughs> I don't want the flowers to all die when I'm here, Grandma. you got to write it all down. I'm not supposed to water them. And I love it that this, this child of hip hop and spoken word and, uh, you know, uh, dreads and all this is like concerned with my flowers, okay? I'm <laughs> taking care of my flowers. I told you I was right because I will subside your head, girl. <laughs> Thank you very much. 